get everyone situated. We're just gonna give everyone a moment to, to log on. All right, I think we're ready to begin. Um, good evening and welcome to tonight's uh, book discussion of Rationality with author and psych psychology professor, Steven Pinker. I'm Josh Nolette. I'm a member of the events staff here at the University Bookstore in Seattle, the oldest independent bookstore in the region. Uh, tonight, Dr. Pinker will be in discussion with University of Washington professor of psychology, uh, Dr. Andrew Meltzoff. Uh, Dr. Steven Pinker is a professor of psychology at Harvard University, a New York Times bestselling author and two-time Pulitzer Prize finalist. In Rationality, Dr. Pinker explains that while we think in ways that are sensible in the low-tech context in which we spend most of our lives, we fail to take advantage of the powerful tools of reasoning our best thinkers have discovered over the millennia. Dr. Andrew Metzoff is a University of Washington professor of psychology, Job and Gertrude Tamaki Endowed Chair and co-director of the UW Institute for Learning and Brain Sciences. In 2020, Dr. Metzoff received the William James Fellow Award from the Association of Psychological Science and the G. Stanley Hall Award for the American Psychological Association for the Distinguished Contributions to Developmental Psychology. Links for rationality and any books mentioned during the talk will be added in the chat. We will be having a Q&A session at the end of the discussion. Please submit any questions you have for the guests in the Q&A field, which you'll find in the bottom of your Zoom window. This event is being filmed for our YouTube channel. And I will turn the microphone over to Dr. Pinker and Dr. Meltzoff. So hi, Steve. I'm really happy and looking forward to talking with you tonight about your new book. Thanks, Andy. Thanks so much for agreeing to the conversation. I'm really delighted. Right. Well, I'm really curious about how this book of uh, rationality came about. The discourse in America seems so irrational nowadays. There's alternative facts, fake news, and a sizable percentage of the population is denying and rejecting life-saving vaccines. Do these kinds of things prompt you to write the book or to put it in another way in the language of your book, what part of this is coincidence and what part is causation? <laughs> yes, uh, a, um, you know, it, it wasn't complete uh, coincidence. Uh, I did teach a course on rationality at Harvard mm -hmm. you know, covering material that, uh, both, both material that cognitive psychologists often uh, cover in, the, in their courses the various biases and fallacies of statistical reasoning uh, and, lo and logical reasoning and confusing causation with correlation. Um, I, br I broadened it to include um, examples of, of applied rationality in the world. I had, uh, as a guest lecturer, I had Michael Lewis talk about Moneyball, the, app of the use of data in sports. We talked about uh, data-driven uh, data medicine with Atul Gawande, uh, data-driven policing, effective altruism, which was the original inspiration of, for the course. Some students in the effective altruism movement asked if I would teach a course in EA, as it's called, which is the, the um, use of um, uh, evidence and data and studies to try to see where a philanthropic dollar can do the most good. 
how it can save, save the most lives. Right. Uh, anyway, these are all examples of applied rationality. But then of course, the other side of the coin was, uh, why does the world seem to be losing its mind? Right. Why the, the, the fake news and the paranormal woo-woo and the post-truth rhetoric? That's something that you know, our, our own science, psychology, um, uh, has always had something to say about confirmation bias and the availability heuristic. But in, in some ways, we're kind of scrambling to keep up with events because uh, our species, our country has hit new depths of irrationality. You mentioned vaccine resistance. And yeah. um, I wanted to explore what literature there is and try to put it together to try to an uh, answer this question that's on everyone's mind. So it gave a certain urgency to the material that I was covering. Also, I, I would want to do one other thing. And this is something that I suspect has occurred to you because it's occurred to so many social scientists and psychologists, which is the kind of tools that we use in our work, signal detection theory and um, correlation and causation and um, uh, Bayesian reasoning. They're kind of, they're not just um, statistical techniques in the lab, they're, they're really ways of sharpening your thinking in so many different domains. And I wanted a, uh, to have a, uh, well, originally a course, but then a book, that would put between two covers the, the tools of thinking that I tend to think everyone should have, should master. Right. Well, you know, in the book, you describe two types of cognition. System one is fast, intuitive, and gut level, and system two is slow, reflective, and deliberate. You put rationality within system two. I was wondering, do you think that system one has anything to do with human rationality? Well, it does. And of course, this is a distinction that was drawn by Daniel Kahneman in uh, his, his work with uh, the late Amos Tversky and then on his own in Thinking Fast and, and Slow, uh, kind of uh, uh, formalizing the contrast between uh, snap judgments and thinking twice. So our, our intuitions, our snap judgments can have some rationality packed into them because they are the result of our experience of learning, of, of uh, being sensitive to, uh, often to, patterns that can't be deduced by step-by-step -step logic, but that emerge from uh, statistical correlations between lots and lots of features. And, and they, they do some things well, like, like recognizing faces and voices. But, uh, but very often, they can lead to a, a confident wrong uh, conclusion. And so for those, you really need to think, think things through. Right. To, be mind, to be mindful, as we, often, as we say nowadays. Right. Uh, well, I want to go a little outside your book and ask you about altruism. Altruism is acting to help others at a cost to the self. So is it rational to be altruistic? After all, it costs you something. If we enhance rationality, will it squeeze out altruism in any way? Uh, well, it, it, no, because, um, and there, there is a literature, of course, in evolutionary biology where the question is acute because uh, one might expect that any altruistic urge would be rapidly selected out because, you know, kind of nice, nice guys finish last in, in evolution. This is the basis, of course, for Richard Dawkins' book, The Selfish Gene. But the, and the, the solutions from uh, evolutionary biology as to how altruism, in the biologist's technical sense of convey, conveying a benefit on another organism at a cost to oneself. Uh, there are several routes by which it can, it can evolve, including uh, being nice to your relatives, which means you're fostering the survival chance of a, um, a gene for being nice to your relatives that has some chance of being inside that relative. So the gene is helping a copy of itself. And reciprocity, that if you, um, yeah do someone a favor, then uh, the tables may turn when you need favor. And um, if they remember uh, who helped and who hurt, then uh, they can return the favor uh, uh, when it's due. Now in humans, of course, that's multiplied by the fact we have language. So reputation uh, is a um, way in which we uh, choose allies and uh, cooperation partners. We uh, uh, hear through the grapevine who's a, you know, who's a good guy and who's a uh -huh. shock. Uh -huh. uh, and um, so there are, uh, there, there are many reasons why we have some kernel of altruism that's, that's evolved in us. And that in order just to be a human, to have social relationships, to not be a, you know, a, a, a hermit or a psychopath, we uh, were altruistic to others. But one can also reason one's way to even greater altruism. And that, and this is, sorry, I'm, it's a roundabout way of getting to your question. Uh, because among the, in the effective altruism movement, there are 
extreme altruists yes. who argue that one should not consume more than the bare minimum and give everything else away. Now, it's not the same as effective altruism, namely what you do give should uh, uh, deliver the greatest benefit. But it is, again, if you're applying rationality so that you're altruistic above and beyond the mere social emotions of being, you know, being nice, having friends, uh, one could reason that it's inconsistent with our other values not to give as much as we can. Peter Singer, of course, is the most famous advocate of that argument in his book, Giving What We Can. Right. And the giving, the giving pledge among billionaires. Now, uh, Bill Gates, a, 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 Seattle, a Seattle boy, and I, I think someone that you, you probably know pretty well, yeah. uh, is, um, uh, is um, associated with both ideas, effective altruism, because he uh, uh -huh. minutely uh, anticipates and measures where the philanthropic donations will do the most good, and the, the, uh, the giving pledge, where he and his, his fellow billionaires, if you can say that, have a pledge to give away um, mo most of their uh, most of their wealth. Right. So thank you for that. Um, you mentioned language, and you're the author of the language instinct as well as rationality. In the language instinct, you likened language to spiders spinning a web. You suggest that it's instinctual in both cases. In this new book, you describe human rationality as something that needs to be explicitly taught. I'm wondering what you'd say to an imaginary author writing an imaginary new book that she intended to entitle The Rationality Instinct. <laughs> I can see where this is going, yes, yeah, right. Well, I, no, it's, it's a great question because uh, I actually would um, uh, note that rationality is partly instinctive and, and, and um, uh, I, I resist the notion throughout the book that we are just um, you know, a bundle of fallacies and biases and just prone to one error after another. I think mm -hmm. we do have instincts that are that that um, uh, that make us rational in particular domains. The problem is that the instincts are baked together with particular kinds of subject matter, mm -hmm. like um, uh, like like uh, um, social obligations, like precautions, like danger, uh, and sometimes some of those instincts actually lead us astray. We have instincts of purity and contamination, and that's one of the reasons that there's been vaccine resistance for as long as there have been vaccines. Uh -huh. Namely, are you telling me you're going to take that actual disease agent, those germs, and you're going to inject them into my body, and that's supposed to be good for me? It disgusting. is disgusting. It's disgusting. <laughs> exactly. It's disgusting. That can't be good. Yeah. So that is part of our rationality instinct, that essentialist uh, intuition. It's, uh, it probably served us well before we had formalized science because it did lead people in a natural environment to look for natural medicines and to avoid contaminants. But now that we have real science, it can uh, get us into trouble. Yeah, I agree. You know, on page 314, you make a striking proposal that rationality should become the fourth R in schooling. And then we'd have reading, writing, arithmetic, and rationality. Is this purely a utopian view on <laughs> your part, or do you think there's any chance of it catching on? I, I think there is a chance. I'm, I'm by no means the first. And um, again, this is kind of a, a, a kind of almost conventional wisdom among social scientists. Uh, I'm sure you've heard over, over beers, why are they still teaching trigonometry when they should be teaching probability? Much yeah. more useful. Uh, and a lot of errors that people make in everyday life, like in risk assessment, come from faulty intuitions of probability. And like reading and writing and arithmetic, it's just a, a kind of tool that you can use for everything. It's not just a narrow subject. It's a, really a tool of thinking. Uh, so I think it, 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 um, it ought to be done. It's been proposed. Uh, literally since the 1930s, H.G. Wells was the first to say, we've got to revamp our curriculum since uh, uh, the medieval you know, quadrivium and trivium with you know, rhetoric and Latin and, and trigonometry and astronomy. Uh, now that we have, you know, the, the medievals didn't have probability. We do. And we should make room in the curriculum for it. And not just probability, but also principles of critical thinking, like uh, uh, avoid ad hominem arguments, avoid arguments from authority, avoid arguments from uh, anecdote, avoid um, moving the goalposts, uh, all of the flaws in reasoning. 
uh, that um, we can recognize and that are all too common in, in our discourse. Now, Grant, I'll, I'll add one asterisk, which is that um, uh, Dan Willingham, a cognitive psychologist who specializes in uh, the efficacy of educational interventions, uh -huh. has noted that the track record of these critical uh -huh. thinking is kind of poor. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the track record of, <laughs> to, be, to be completely honest of everything we teach in the university. Does he believe the data? Uh, I think he believes the data, yes. Uh, okay, that's uh, a check on his own rationality, yeah. yeah, yeah indeed, uh, I think he has reason to, to believe. But there are there uh -huh. are more and less effective ways of teaching anything, uh, mm -hmm. including mm -hmm. principles of critical thinking. So for example, we just uh -huh. know that it's just a fact of human beings that people are, are uh, stick to the example they've been taught and they have a lot of trouble generalizing to some yeah. different yeah. example. Uh, if you learn about the sunk cost fallacy when it comes to uh, paying for uh, uh, developing an aircraft, it doesn't occur to you that it also applies to um, you know, sitting through a bad movie because uh, they're so superficially um, uh, dissimilar. And yeah. these curricula have to really um, kind of force the similarities on students for them to be effective. But I, I do think that it's, if education is for anything, it's to get people to think better. And so I, I actually would lobby for that if, I, if anyone asked me. All right. Well, that leads me to ask you, could there be something like too much rationality in society? If you educate people, if you push people, do you think there's any limits or does rationality squeeze out anything or it's unmitigated good? How do you think about that? In other words, there are these stereotypes and fears about turning everybody into Dr. Spock. What are your views on that? Yes, that's right. Um, well, partly it's, uh, and I, I do push back against the, um, the stereotype of the, the, the brainiac, the nerd, the Spock, the, uh, the, the, the joyless, uh, uh, drudge the accountant with a green eye shade, because um, that's not what rationality means. Rationality is relative to a goal. You have to deploy reason in order to come to some conclusion, whether it be objective truth or a uh, deep explanation or getting something done in the world. And there's nothing that says that that goal can't be deep human relationships and love and appreciation of beauty. Uh, so they're, they're by, by no means incompatible. Uh, so actually, realize, once you realize that rationality is not the opposite of pleasure, joy, beauty, meaning, um, then I think it is an unmitigated good. Now, this isn't to say that everyone who claims to be rational is rational, but in a way, that's the point, that if someone who claims to be rational isn't, the only way we can say that is by deploying rationality. And that's one of the beauties of rationality, is it can always hop up a level and look at applications of itself. Mm. We can say by upping our game in rationality, saying, well, we thought we were being rational, but were we really? Maybe we were mistaken. Yeah, right. Well, um, you, do you need language, do you think, to be rational? Could an organism that doesn't have language be rational like an infant? Is there such a thing as a rational infant? Well, our... Uh, I, <laughs> You yourself and your 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 family and your colleagues uh, can certainly speak to that, and, and my colleagues. Um, but yes, we we have reason to believe that there's a, a reasonable amount of rationality going on in the head of a of an infant. Um, that uh, certainly language um, amplifies it in uh -huh. at least two ways. The two obvious ways are you share ideas with others, and you can uh, enhance. You have another way of representing them uh, in your head. You can yeah. use snatches of internal monologue as an extra memory booster. Mm -hmm. uh, but, it's, but I think language is not the itself the essence of rationality because for one thing, English is just too vague and ambiguous and incomplete and, 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 and sloppy to be a medium of actual uh, deduction, rationality, reasoning. We think in a much more abstract uh, language, uh, abstract uh, medium, I mean, representation, because language is just too you know, messy and social. Um, but once we have language, we can uh, kind of exponentiate rationality because we can criticize other people's ideas, we can build on their tools, we can build tools out of tools out of tools, 
and um, kind of lift ourselves up by our bootstraps to well the feats that we our civilization enjoys like yeah. like like smartphones and and um, uh, vaccines. So related to that, I'm wondering whether there are building blocks of rationality. You write in your book about the importance of being able to adopt an impartial viewpoint that doesn't privilege your view necessarily over other people's views. Can you share a little bit more about how impartiality relates to rationality? Yeah, they're, they're really, um, rationality is, is almost by definition impartial. That is, if I talk about uh, you know, my, my rationality, I'm not really talking about rationality. Um, it's like the, uh, what was it, Kellyanne Conway with um, alternative facts. If they're alternative facts, they're not facts. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and likewise, uh, the principles of reason are ones that any intelligent agent uh, should be able to recognize and, and uh, deploy. Um, and one of the main impediments, probably perhaps the biggest impediment to rationality is motivated reasoning and the my side bias. Uh -huh. Namely, you uh, kind of pick a conclusion and you uh, kind of uh, torture your rationality to end up with the conclusion that you wanted to be true in the first place. Uh -huh. And often that conclusion is one that makes your own sect, your tribe, your clique look um, noble and wise and makes the other uh, sect look evil and stupid. Right. Well, I'm wondering whether as a follow-up to that, what do you think about the role of diversity in rationality? Is it possible that hearing a diversity of opinions is kind of a spark plug for building rationality? And that goes back to your ideas about how language interacts with this and maybe dialogue with others and argumentation and so forth. Yes. Now, of course, diversity has become a um, uh, kind of a code word. Um, I mean, diversity of opinion is absolutely essential, simply because none of us is infallible. None of us is omniscient. Um, none of us has been vouchsafed with the truth through, through revelation. You know, we all bumble along, trying out hypotheses, hoping hoping that that, uh, that some will be confirmed. But we've got to have other people who don't believe those hypotheses that will hold our feet to the fire and point out the flaws. And it's only by this disputation and uh, mm -hmm. open debate yeah. uh, with the diversity of, of, of uh, opinions that we have some hope of, of uh, achieving knowledge. Uh, I, I quote some anonymous uh, wag who said, the, the uh, more we disagree, the greater the chances that, that at least one of us will be right. <laughs> now, this is related, it's not identical, to simply having um, people of different you know, genders and races and sexual orientations in the room. It can be helpful when the issue concerns lived experience that some people just have and other people just don't. Um, on the other hand, it is not true that you know, all women think alike or all black people or all white people. And so simply uh, having a racial mixture or a gender mixture doesn't give you the magic ingredient of a diversity of opinion. Okay. Right. Um, so in the book, you talk about something that I found very fascinating about rationality feeding in on the one hand to wisdom and on the other hand to morality. Can you talk about how it contributes to both of those things? Yeah, I mean, this is this is maybe a little bit, you know, a, a little bit simplifying, but um, in, in talking about why, why do people, you and I talked a few minutes ago about whether there's a tension between rationality and emotion with, with Mr. Spock as the archetype of, uh, oh, we have to remember, of course, he was half human, but, uh, but still more, more rational than your typical human. Yeah. Um, uh, but um, wh why do we feel that they're in tension? And I think the, um, the, the, the two reasons are, one of them is that often when we talk about reason versus emotion, what we're talking about is um, what economists sometimes call discounting the future and what psychologists call self-control or delay of gratification. Uh -huh. Namely, we are tempted with a, a, um, a large reward in the future and a small reward now, and we succumb to the small temptation now. Uh, and uh, so we cheat our future self for the benefit of our present self. And uh, the uh, it works to the disadvantage of both selves because the reward that we cheat the future self out of is greater than the one that we enjoy now, such as junk food now versus health over the long term, 
um, you know, exploding in, in, in uh, blowing your stack or succumbing to a fatal attraction now at the expense of your long-term relationships. Uh, all of that's, those are a lot of the cases where people talk about a tension between um, reason and emotion. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, a lot of what, I think what we call wisdom is how do we reconcile the different goals that we harbor? We want lots of things, you can't have them all, uh, what do you do about that predicament of the human condition? And, and a lot of wisdom is how do you adjudicate among the different the, the different goals that we have? Um, and then the other source of conflict is uh, one person's goals can conflict with another person's goals. Uh -huh. And then the question is how do you adjudicate the um, situation in which not everyone can get what they want? And a lot of what we call ethics and morality is how we... Um, how we deal with the fact that, that people's goals can come into conflict. Most obviously, when one person tries to exploit another for his or her own advantage, uh, you know, that's um, one person's goal is made at the expense of another, and then we say that's not okay. Right, right. Uh, I just want to remind the viewers that the chat line is open, and so people should put, uh, feel free to put questions in that Steve Pinker can answer at the end of our dialogue here. So I hope you're doing that uh, presently. Uh, I want to move on to just a few other questions, Steve, and one is, do we live in a more rational world today than we did 50 years ago, 100 years ago, or even during the, age, the golden age of Athens? Is rationality increasing or decreasing, do you think? Yeah, certainly. Well, I, I tend to think there's a lot of rationality inequality, that at the, uh, the high end, we've been more rational than ever. I mean, the, our, our technology, our science, mm -hmm. uh, have just, uh, you know, I think the, the, the progress has been uh, breathtaking. Uh, our knowledge is of, of history, of uh, philosophy is cumulative. We kind of know everything that the Greeks knew, plus a whole lot more. Uh, so our knowledge is kind of a superset of theirs. And they believed, you know, a fair number of crazy things um, and, and, and had a lot of crazy practices, not least of them slavery. Uh -huh. um, and disenfranchisement of, of uh, women, yeah. and uh, and belief in their you know their their their, their cockamamie gods, um, you know. Granted, the best of them were were were, were pretty good. All of it's been said. All philosophy, philosophy is a set of footnotes to Plato, uh, but he really did come up with a lot of the issues that we've been debating ever since. Um, so, in, uh, the question, the, the thing is that there is a always a baseline though of the superstition, the conspiracy um, theories, the fake news. They're by no means new. The yeah. cons conspiracy theories uh, go back centuries, if not further. There would be a theory of the Illuminati, the protocols of the elders of Zion, uh, various yeah. conspiracy theories resulted in ethnic riots at various times in, in uh, history. and. Uh, um, paranormal phenomena, well, they, they're kind of what we call religious miracles. I mean, they were kind of the original fake news or the miracle, stories of miracles and yeah. scriptures. Uh -huh. uh, so they've always been with us. Uh, we have means to uh, move away from them, and a lot of us still don't. And I found to my great disappointment, because I like to plot charts of human progress. Yeah. So I went back to survey data on astrology and various paranormal phenomena over the last uh, 40 or 50 years, mm -hmm. long, as long as, as we have had continuous data. Mm -hmm. And I have to, I'm, I'm disappointed to say that it's, it's pretty flat. Uh -huh. Some of them go a little bit up, some go a little bit down, but uh, I, I had thought that we'd be you know, far more rational than our, and, than our uh, generation before, but, but no. No, but no. Uh, yeah. So how, because you think rationality can be taught and ought to be taught in school and so forth, I'm wondering, is there any present day country or culture or even one in history that valued rationality in the way that you'd like to see it valued? Huh. There's, a, uh, there are reasons to think that a lot of our um, uh, democratic peers do a better job at it than we do. Mm -hmm. uh, that there's, uh, you know, we are, locked in uh, some you know, crazy political polarization. Um, and then pol not that other countries aren't polarized, but there tend to be more experiments in how to do democracy, like deliberative democracy, citizens councils, like, like they have in uh, Switzerland, 
among other places, more evidence-based policy, um, sharing among public servants of uh, expertise, uh, and um, uh, by many measures of success, we uh, Americans, uh, you know, we're not number one. We have worse rates of crime and obesity and drug addiction and inequality and unhappiness. I mean, we're better than middle income and poor countries, but among rich countries, I think we're just about any Commonwealth or Western European country does, does better than us. Yeah. In terms of uh, things clustering within an individual with rationality within that individual, are there a cluster of traits, characteristics, skills uh, that uh, individuals who might be considered highly rational have? You mentioned one maybe about self-control, but maybe you can elaborate on that. Yeah, there is a, a cluster of traits um, that are uh, roughly but imperfectly correlated with intelligence that uh, comprise, um, they do comprise a, a kind of cognitive self-control. I mean, you don't go for the first uh, quick answer. Mm -hmm. uh, those people also tend to be less susceptible so, to some of the classic fallacies of the kind that Tversky and Kahneman explain, like confirmation bias and, and um, uh, um, sunk cost fallacy, um, uh, overconfidence. Uh, they tend to be less uh, susceptible to paranormal beliefs. They mm -hmm. tend to be less impressed by, and this is a technical term in the literature, um, uh, bullshit, uh, in a <laughs> sense, uh, yeah. uh, fancy sounding verbiage that doesn't actually mean anything. Uh -huh. uh, so they, they, they tend to go together, as Keith Stanovich calls it, the, the rationality quotient. Um, the uh, uh, act of open-mindedness is also part mm. of this cluster, namely, do you, um, are you willing to give up your beliefs when evidence contradicts them or do you uh, stick with them to the bitter end just because you think they reflect on your ego? Um, Jonathan Barron talks about active open-mindedness and, uh, and I think it tends to be correlated with these other traits as well. Again, none of them perfectly. They're you know, a cluster of things that tend to hang together. Right. Um, so in order to, uh, you sometimes talk about rationality as a, as a set of tools and techniques, but other places in the book, you talk about rationality as a goal or value that can be achieved. So uh, do you think of rationality in, those, in, in multiple ways like that? Or you, you spend a lot of the middle chapters talking about the tools and techniques to increase it, right? But yes. Yeah, some of the, the logical and mathematical bodies of knowledge that have, we've developed over the millennia, like logic itself, like probability theory, like Bayesian reasoning, uh, namely evaluating yeah. hypotheses uh, in the face of, of data, uh, correlation and causation. So they are tools. And then there, there is, um, I guess, the greater commitment to, to use those tools. That is not to fall back on our snap judgments. There's even a, a subculture calls itself the rationality community okay, that okay. tries to promote uh, this, th these values. Like you shouldn't dig your heels in and argue for a position to the, to the, to the bitter end. You mm -hmm. should maybe put a level of credence, a probability, like I'm 0.8 confident that this is true. Uh, listening to your argument, now I'm gonna ratchet it down to 0.7 rather than, you know, I'm right, you're wrong. Yeah. Um, uh, and so that would be rationality in, in the sense of a kind of commitment, uh, a commitment to use the tools of rationality uh -huh. um, more broadly, yeah. Right. Uh, so the last question I would want to ask is, will greater uh, rationality increase human happiness and flourishing? I, I tend to think so. Uh, and this is a topic uh, on which I've written two other books, The Better Angels of Our Nature, on the decline of violence over history and enlightenment now on, on uh, progress and um, enlightenment values. But the, the data suggests that, that uh, we have reduced um, disease and war and poverty and crime and illiteracy and drudgery. And it didn't happen because nature smiled on us. Quite the contrary, nature uh, kind of has it in for us. Uh, the extent to which progress happens, it's because uh, people have deployed their brain power with the goal of making uh, other people better off. 
that's really the only explanation for how progress could happen. Uh -huh. uh, now, of course, it's not enough to be rational because you could apply your rationality to you know, bigger and better nuclear weapons, to right. bioweapons, you know, bio uh, to uh, complicated financial instruments that make investors some money at the cost of taking down the whole economy. You know, it, it, there, there still has to be the goal of yeah. improving human welfare, humanism, as I, I call it. Um, although I think when we step back and we say, well, which goals ought we to have? Uh, I think human flourishing is what we end up with. Right. So, okay, thank you very much, Steve. I really uh, enjoyed the conversation and, and appreciate mm -hmm. that you wrote a book that prompts us to reflect on the benefits of rationality during this time when it feels as though society has lost its mind. You know, I thought of it as a very uplifting and intellectually stimulating and satisfying book. And I felt better after having read it. So thank you very much for spending your time with us today. And I'm hoping that we have some interesting questions. I know there was a lot of excitement in the University of Washington community uh, to hear today. And, there were some people from philosophy, law school, computer science, various people writing to me. So we'll see what the questions yield. Well, th thank you, Andy. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for agreeing to have a conversation. Thank you. So Josh or, yeah. All right, well, we do have some questions. Um, first question, language and the brains seem to connect the two of you. Can you speak to conceptual semantics and how the brain uses language as an instrument to navigate and manipulate the world? Yeah, I am. Um, I mean, uh, conceptual semantics is a term, at least that I associate with uh, my, my friend and occasional co-author, Ray Jackendoff, who has used language as a, uh, a window into cognition. That is one of the cat base categories it, it, with which we conceive the world, categories like place and thing and path and cause and agent and means and manner, kind of the, 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 the almost like the alphabet of, of uh, thought. I and mean, he's not the only one. Uh, and it's something that I've long been interested in. I wrote a book called The Stuff of Thought, Language as a Window into Human Nature. I wrote a much more technical book called Learnability and Cognition, not, not sold at the University of Washington bookstore. Uh, because it's uh, quite technical. But yes, I think language can be a, uh, a crucial window into what are the building blocks of thought. And they relate to these basic intuitions that are, I think, sometimes the source of modern irrationality, even though they worked well in a more traditional national, natural environment. Things like the intuition of essentialism, that living things house a, an essence that give them their forms and powers, like dualism, uh, namely, we have both a mind and a body, and they can part company, like um, uh, design, that um, complex things must have had a designer. Um, and they're, they're embedded often in the way that we speak, and mm -hmm. we, uh, they sometimes work, but with modern science, we can kind of think our way outside them and, and do better. All right, um, another question. How do the definitions of rationality and artificial intelligence and computer science accord with you, with uh, your studies of human rationality? Yeah, I think they, uh, I think they do, and I've been influenced by the foundations of artificial intelligence, going back to the origin of the field with uh, uh, Alan Newell and Herbert Simon and Marvin Minsky, um, uh, going back to, to the fifties, which required thinking the deepest thought of what do we mean by intelligence. Uh, or, or rationality. And I, I think of artificial intelligence like logic, like probability, like statistics, as a source of um, what are in the business called normative models. That is models of how one ought to reason in order to attain a certain goal in, an, in a particular environment. Artificial intelligence obviously is not by itself psychology, it's not, doesn't immediately tell us how, how the human brain thinks, but it, it sets a, a kind of set of benchmarks. What would it take? How could any system uh, accomplish things like recognizing an object, retrieving a memory, coming to a, a, a sensible deduction? Um, and so uh, I think they are intimately related in the way that, that, that AI 
helps us clarify the normative models of what rationality actually consists of. All right, well, how important is basic evolutionary psychology to understanding the origins of thinking generally and the evolution of reasoning? Could you comment on the Sherber, Mercier and their, and their evolutionary arguments? Yes, um, I was, uh, well, Dan Sperber and Hugo Mercier um, made a, a very strong argument that, that reasoning, explicit reasoning, evolved in order to win arguments, not to get to the truth. You know, I, I think there's a lot in that. I think it's, it, 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 it's probably stated a bit too strongly because uh, in general, you don't let other people win arguments unless they have at least some claim to getting closer to the, to the truth. Uh, there's a philosopher named Andrew Norman who uh, believes that, that, that for the function of reasoning is to kind of align beliefs, not just to win arguments. Um, taking a step back as to, I think it is essential to ask the que functional questions, why did reasoning evolve uh, in the first place? Um, winning arguments, I think, is not the only answer. And I, in fact, begin the book with a discussion of rationality kind of in the, in the wild, as it were, the San people of the Kalahari Desert, they um, track their prey in their persistence hunting using sophisticated forms of, of uh, probability, uh, probabilistic reasoning, Bayesian reasoning, correlation and causation, uh, logical inference. And uh, it gives us, a, a, since they do represent the kind of lifestyle that characterizes a lot of our evolutionary history, it opens up a, a role for uh, reasoning in kind of bending the world to our will, yeah. figuring out what kind of animals left those tracks and, and how to track them down. Uh, now, by the way, this is a somewhat of a departure for the, from the way evolution is often invoked in um, giving us an excuse for our bad reasoning, saying, well, what can you expect of, of uh, descendants of, of hunter-gatherers who always had to be on edge for a predator who's lurking in the grass? And that's the explanation for our system one and our quick uh, uh, reflexes and our, our impulses. I mean, there, there's something to that. But what I tried to show in my discussion of this son is that system two also had an adaptive basis. It wasn't just winning arguments. It was putting putting food on the table mm -hmm. and, and, keeping your, and keeping yourself from being food for, from other animals. Uh, and a lot of that is done very cerebrally in, in among hunter-gatherers. Mm -hmm. So I have two questions here that touch on, uh, how does the emotion of disgust aid or hinder the ability to think rationally? Yeah, uh, I think it's, um, you know, largely hinders it. Uh, it, um, you know, it, it helped it in, in before we had microbiology and public health and virology and immunology, where the best that we could do is, you know, don't eat a putrid cartridge uh, carcass. Don't, uh, uh, if someone's got, you know, oozing runny sores, then, you know, keep your distance. Um, so that, that's better than nothing. Uh, but now, not only do we um, sometimes fall back on disgust as a kind of primitive public health, but um, we moralize disgust and we often feel that anything that gives us the creeps must be immoral. And there is a, a, a bleed over in things like um, uh, homophobia, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, xenophobia, the, the dietary practices, the sexual practices of, of another culture must be immoral because they are unfamiliar to me and they gross me out. And I think over uh, the, uh, resistance to advances in biomedical technology, like in vitro fertilization, uh, blood transfusions, uh, organ transfusions, anesthesia, all of them were resisted out of, originally out of a sense of disgust. We now recognize that they are tremendously benevolent because we overcame that primitive sense of disgust. So by and large, I would say that it's an impediment now. Oh, someone is wondering um, the, the use of steel manning as a cognitive tool in, uh, in contrast to straw manning. And what yeah, that's a, a term that uh, comes from critical thinking uh, curricula and it's 
championed by people in the rationality community. There's a new book by Julia Galef called The Scout Mindset that uh, kind of presents that to the world. So a steel man is the opposite of a straw man. The straw manning is the fallacy where you uh, set up a kind of effigy of the person you're arguing uh, against, attributing to that straw man uh, some absurd extreme belief that the, the real person doesn't have just so you could knock them down. Steel manning is you formulate the strongest possible version of the hypothesis that you're trying to argue against. Mm -hmm. If you can show flaws in that, then you've made a point and you haven't just uh, engaged in kind of cheap debating tricks. Mm -hmm. So the steel manning, steel manning is, is a, a kind of a rationality virtue. Mm -hmm. Right, and they were wondering if that is sort of in the toolkit of, yeah, yeah, exactly. So yes, and, and, and yeah. the answer is absolutely yes. Absolutely, yes. yes. Okay, so um, are emotions and rationality independent? How do emotions influence rationality and vice versa? Mm -hmm. I, tend to, I tend to think of emotions as the source of the goals that rationality pursues. Uh, the, because rationality always is a means to an end and the end um, has to come from somewhere and the emotions are often what provide them, such as um, safety and comfort and love, uh, although also sometimes you know, aggression and vengeance and dominance. Um, the, uh, and as, as, as kind of emerged in our conversation before, we often pit emotion against reason when we have some short-term goal that seems to crowd out a longer term goal. That is when we succumb to the heat of the moment and we achieve some narrow goal that feels good in, in the moment, like blowing your stack or blowing your paycheck, uh, uh, but that, that, that uh, conflicts with one of your longer term goals. So they're both goals. Um, neither one is inherently more rational than the other. We, we say that there's a conflict often when it's um, small, short-term reward, larger, long-term reward. Someone is wondering, uh, how about creativity? How does rationality promote or hinder human imagination? Well, it's, um, you know, the thing about rationality is you could apply it to anything, including enhancing creativity. Rationality is not the same as creativity. Um, um, although once you're, you set the goal of how do I come up with a solution to this problem that no one has thought of before, or a new source of pleasure or enlightenment or transcendence, then you can deploy your rationality to achieve that. That is, your rationality is a way of pursuing uh, for forms of creativity. You said that good rationality leads to impartiality. Does that equate to objectivity? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. All right. Let's see here. Um, how do you see rationality, intera rationality interacting with worldview? That is, a set of beliefs about how the world works, spiritual beliefs, and so forth. Consider Buddhist thinkers, for example. Yeah, so I'm, I don't know enough about Buddhism to, um, you know, to, to answer that in any kind of erudite way. And Buddhism, unlike some of the uh, uh, other major religions, does not um, rely as much on clearly fanciful factual beliefs, such as miracles and um, uh, uh, gods and spirits. Um, and a lot, in, and at least people who uh, are knowledgeable about Buddhism and um, uh, and extol it as a, as a view, I think would would argue that it is um, uh, that there's a lot of rationality uh, in it. Now, if that is true, it ought to be rationality that any of us can appreciate. And uh, Robert Wright in his book "Why Buddhism Is True" certainly takes up that challenge. That is, you don't have to be born a Buddhist. Uh, the he tries to make a persuasive case for it, in which case, it, uh, to the extent that he succeeds, then it would be rational. Mm -hmm. All right, I have a couple of questions about um, your recommendations for parents, caregivers, um, et cetera, uh, for raising future generations to foster rationality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Well, um, certainly active open-mindedness would be way up there, namely um, mm. uh, instead of digging in and defending your belief like it's a precious possession, you should be always ask the question, what would, uh, what would in principle show me that I'm wrong uh, in, in this particular belief? To uh, consider uh, opinions of others, to learn to uh, spot some obvious fallacies of reasoning, like reasoning by anecdote, by by availability. If something, if you read about it in the news, it must be common. If someone got eaten by a shark, uh, then you stay out of uh, last week, then you stay out of the water because all you can think about is the shark attack, but you don't keep track of the far more plentiful deaths from car crashes that don't make the news but pile up in much greater numbers and pose a greater threat to life and limb. Uh, skepticism, not in the sense of disbelieving everything, but of needing good reasons to believe things. Uh -huh. These me mental habits, a combination of cognitive tools to be acquired, like probability, and mental habits of uh, being open to persuasion, uh, deploying the tools where they're called for, um, you know, that would be a start. And I guess I'll, I'll throw in one thing that has not come up in our conversation yet, which is that a lot of rationality really consists of submitting to the rules of a community that um, enforces norms of uh, criticism and evaluation and peer review and fact checking and adversarial processes that uh, allow the whole community to be more rational than any of the individual members. That's what makes science work. It isn't that there's a, a lone genius who gets to publish his or her um, eurekas and brain children. The scientist has to write up the results and submit it to a journal and it's subject to peer review. And then if it is published then to criticism and replication attempts and so on, you know, in journalism, there's fact checking and editing and corrections and a reputation for accuracy. So you've got to be able to say, it's not about me. I've got to be willing to uh, be part of a group that follows rules that, that make us rational. Okay, I have a question that's pertinent to both of, your, both of you here. Um, but do, you, do you think there are ever a point where rationality and instinct are the same? For example, in infancy? We are guided by built-in needs and instincts, but in order to achieve goals and to achieve goals in only ways we can. How are we separate? How are they separated at this time? And when do they separate? <laughs> well, this is a. Uh, I think I might def defer to my yeah. colleague. Here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, we'll come back to you, Steve. Um, I would say that it is possible to view or test rationality in infants. And one of the interesting things that has been discovered over the past years with infants is that they do revise their opinions or theories or beliefs about the world based on evidence and actually conduct something like little mini experiments themselves on the high chair table to figure things out. So what's important about that is they are driven to try to understand the world. Uh, Kant wrote a lot about, and Stephen uh, quotes Kant about the daring to understand, and little children really are uh, motivated to try to understand and be able to explain uh, the exceptions, the things that violate the rules that they have in mind, and they repeat behaviors over and over again to test it. So in some little way, we're built, and you could argue there's an instinct for doing experimentation and testing out your ideas. But I don't think that one would argue that little infants, preverbal infants, can engage in the sites of rationality that Stephen's talking about, which often emerges from linguistic dialogues and testing one point of view publicly and socially with others. So uh, yeah, there's a lot of development involved. Yeah, yes. And, uh... There was a, a satirical article in The Onion a few years ago, kind of poking fun at our field, which uh, has a history of uncovering all the amazing things that babies do. The headline was, study proves babies are stupid. Uh, <laughs> That's the headline, yeah. That was, that was the headline of The Onion article. Um, so babies clearly are, there, there is an awful lot of rationality going on in the mind, mind of an infant. And that's kind of the scaffolding on which future 
uh, learning takes place, but future learning indeed does take place. And one way to kind of, to kind of clarify the question is uh, rationality and, um, is ambiguous. It could mean the normative standards of what actually is rational, it, or it could mean the cognitive processes by which we do our best. Uh, it, if you use the near synonym reason, you could contrast reason with reasoning. Uh -huh. where reason would be the laws of mathematics and logic and, and, and science. Uh, reasoning is our often feeble uh, efforts to, to, to deal with these, the, the, these, uh, these truths. And so asking the question, are infants, there is their rationality. I mean, there is in the sense that there's a lot going on in their minds. Uh, and it's not random, uh, not in the sense of they grasp the kind of uh, truth that you grasp after uh, uh, many years of education. All right. Uh, do you believe AI will pr ever produce perfect rationality? There's probably no such thing as perfect rationality because there are always trade-offs. And going back to one of the founders of rationality, Herbert Simon, um, he pointed. He, he introduced the concept of bounded rationality. It may have been one of the one of the ideas that that uh, earned him his Nobel Prize. That because rationality, any any particular kind of rationality, has costs in terms of resources, memory, and, and CPU cycles, um, acquisition of relevant data. Uh, all in practice, all systems have to have various compromises and trade offs. So probably perfect, for that reason, perfect rationality doesn't exist. And probably another reason that can't exist is when it comes to induction, that is going from some observations to a general law, there is no algorithm that's guaranteed to deliver the truth. It's always, it's inherently fallible. It depends on experimentation, depends on feedback from, from the world. Uh, and um, so the, 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 the image of the all powerful AI that can deduce the, Future of the universe from a few from from fixed premises is, is almost certainly impossible. All right, I think we have time for one more question. And um, uh, emotions are said to be biological, physiological at the bottom line. Can you elaborate on how rationality can be considered biological at its physiology? Yeah, I think that you know, no, no less than emotion, rationality is a, a biological a, a adaptation. Um, and again, I begin the book with the, uh, some vivid illustrations of how hunter-gatherers yeah. depend on, on rationality to, uh, to, to, to claw a living in, in, in deserts and, and unforgiving environments by savvy, by know-how. Um, it, it's implemented in the brain. There we circuits largely involving the, the frontal lobe in, in, uh, conjunction with the parietal lobes to engage in step-by-step -step reasoning. And uh, the, the emotions give us our goals, uh, including safety and love and fear and, and competition. And rationality means that unlike, that more so than other animals, we're really, really good at, um, at attaining them. Mm -hmm. Especially when we pool our rationality with others via language. And that's uh, one of the ways that language enters the picture, namely it multiplies rationality by allowing different partially rational agents to exchange the fruits of their rationality, both mm. their discoveries and mm. the ability to poke holes in other yeah. people's arguments. And this gets back to winning arguments. Well, you, yeah. thanks to language, we can, we can criticize other, pe other people's arguments. And in general, when a group is, is devoted to getting to the right answer, and they're allowed to voice their uh, opinions and their disagreements, they do better than individuals. All right, well, I think that's our time. So thank you to everyone for attending tonight's discussion and for supporting an independent bookstore. And we hope to see you again soon. Uh, links to rationality can be found on our events page and in the chat on the, on the right there. Uh, thank you to Dr. Pinker and Dr. Mertzoff for sharing the conversation with us. Thanks University of Washington Bookstore. Thanks, Andy. Okay, thanks, Steve.